Thank you so much for uh, inviting me here. I'm uh, Manohar. Uh, I teach at uh, Nalsar University of Law, uh, courses like Law and Language, Law and Literature, etc. So I have a PhD in Cultural Studies, um, during which I worked on uh, Telugu language, modern, it's called Modernity of Telugu. That's the only excuse why I'm here. Otherwise, I don't think uh, there are any other great reasons. Uh, so I did some work on Telugu um, vernacular journals as well because of my PhD, as part of my PhD work. Uh, so, and I also attended a conference which uh, Swanton and Rahul organized at Gita University on journals, Dalit journals, etc. So it's, I'm happy that I'm coming again to listen to them and see what where they are now. Uh, so the format is, I think, slightly different today. Uh, so I would uh, speak for maybe some 10 minutes, introduction or even less than that. I wasn't really planning to speak even for five minutes. I thought I'll speak little, very little. But I think one of the panelists is not here as given in the schedule uh, Narsimha Murthy because of some health emergency. So I thought, okay, I should take that opportunity now and he's not here. Sorry that he's not here, but uh, I therefore can spend a little more time. Uh, and then uh, instead of uh, each speaker speaking, I think that's the format yesterday. So I will ask them some questions and we may have a conversation, more like a dialogue. Uh, and probably at the end of it, then it will be open for questions. Okay, and uh, let me just introduce uh, the speakers today. Uh, Dr. Shantan Mandal uh, is a graduate from the University of Hyderabad. Uh, he is currently an asso asso associate professor in the Department of English at Geetham University, Hyderabad. His areas of interest are reading, print, readership, uh, 19th century literature, Dalit studies and translation. He has been an Erasmus Mundus Fellow at the University of Oxford during 2015 and 16. He has received the University of Heidelberg Travel Grant 2015 and the University Grants Commission Travel Grant 2016. Currently, he is involved in developing digital archive of the little magazines, Dalit periodicals, ranging from 1960 to 2000 as a part of the research project titled Mapping Vernacular Network of Ideas and Recovering the Ephemeral, Dalit Literature in Marathi and Bangla Little Magazines, along with uh, Dr. Rahul Hiraman, Rahul Jondle. Uh, so that's about uh, Dr. Shantan. Then moving on to Dr. Rahul. Uh, he's a doc he has a PhD in English, bracketed uh, cultural studies. Uh, from the English and Foreign Language University, Hyderabad. Uh, he is an associate professor of English at the same university, Githam University. His doctoral research was titled Religious Conversion and Dalit Experience, a study of the meanings of conversion among the Neo-Buddhists, which uh, emphasizes the phenomenon of Dalit conversion to Buddhism and uh, studies the conversion movement in Nandir district, which is in the Marathwada region of Maharashtra, uh, through collecting and analyzing historical records, pamphlets, posters, record books, etc. He has received a prestigious fellowship from the Center for the Study of Developing Societies, New Delhi, for his doctoral research. Currently, uh, he, along with uh, Dr. Shantan, is involved in developing the digital archive of the little magazines, Dalit periodicals, as part of the same project that I have mentioned, which is titled Mapping Vernacular Network of Ideas and Recovering the Ephemeral Dalit Literature in Marathi and Bangla Literature Magazines. So that's the introduction of today's uh, two speakers. Uh, so some of the things probably that might come as part of discussion, I would just start off some, uh, introductory, some introductory remarks and it could be later on maybe opened up for discussion. Uh, one of the First thing that anyone who does any research on vernacular journals in India would uh, face is that they're in such pathetic condition, both material as well as the research that is done until now. 
we'll come to the Dalit journals later. Let me begin with the mainstream journals in the Indian languages. Very little interest, very little research is done in this area. And it's not easy to access even the mainstream journals. Uh, and there are very, very few scholars who you could rely on, even for help. I mean, situation may vary from language to language, but more, it's only a degree of difference. It's not like uh, this, the kind of research that happens in English or the resources or the scholars. You have a huge network of that, but that doesn't exist simply for Indian languages. Now, one question that one could ask is, what is that made these uh, languages to be in this kind of a situation. Now, if you go back a little to the colonial period, now when I was looking at uh, the Telugu material and Telugu journal books, etc., uh, which began to be published from the 1830s onwards, I realized that for almost 400 years, it was a very vibrant work that was happening. So much of enthusiasm by the publishers, so much of enthusiasm by the scholars, there's a lot of innovation. Um, so many new journals were started with, uh, um, even some of the people who started these journals, they put their own personal money and they traveled. And So you had a wide range of journals. Of course, the majority of them were started by the elite, the regional elite and the upper caste people. Of course, that again varies. Professor Maya Pandit is here and Western part of India is not the same story as others. The Tamil Nadu story is not the same as the, uh, the, even the Telugu states now. So, but despite that, one can still say that there was uh, so much of work that was happening and anyone from any part of the world would imagine that once the colonial period ends and you have freedom and then you have a nation uh, an independent nation here, anyone would think that these languages will now flourish and they will grow more and then they will have new life. Now what has happened is exactly the opposite in India. Now you have a complete decline after Indi India gets independence. There is almost complete negligence of the Indian languages in every sphere, whether it's in education, literature, uh, publication, etc. So slowly you have a situation where you can't find many publishers in Telugu or in uh, Marathi or in Hindi, even Hindi. I mean, Hindi and Bengali are slightly better for historical reasons. And from the South, Tamil has a slightly different uh, history. But more or less otherwise, uh, there are very few publishers. And publishers are now saying that we can no longer publish. And now the oldest publisher in Hyderabad, HBT Hyderabad Book Trust, is unwilling to publish any Telugu books and they have now started an English series called Southside Books because they don't find market for Telugu books anymore. So uh, now, now why, what is this independent India has done to these languages and why has it come? I, I think I just want to share some ideas. Now once you have independent India, now there was a lot of discussion prior to that about Indian languages where they said, you know, once there is independence, then we will focus more. English will go, the English oppression will go, and Indian languages will come to life. A lot of that happened. Once independence was achieved, now you have what is generally uh, said by the scholars as Nehru in modern India, which is aspiring to build this uh, great modern nation, which is supposed to compete with Europe, etc. And also, you had by then uh, a sizable number of Anglophone class in India who has got benefits from the English education, from the colonial rule, who are unwilling to forego the benefits that uh, English has given them. And then there is also a pan-Indian bureaucracy in place, which has, which again was threatened by the vernacular languages if they had to come to power and then if English is displaced, what would happen to their power? So you have a kind of a alliance, if one could say. There was an alliance between the bureaucracy, bureaucracy uh, the Congress party leadership, high command, uh, where they decided that English is going to stay in India. And modernization, and for a Nehruian kind of an India, it was argued that uh, 
you can't produce, for example, uh, books in science so quickly because everybody was in a hurry to build this nation and make it into a modern India and rapid development was uh, supposed to happen. And for that reason, they thought it should be, um, it should be it's important to retain English. And once English was retained, I am not going to the story of Tamil Nadu because that will take another one hour to explain. Uh, because Tamil Nadu wanted English to be retained because they don't want, they didn't want the Hindi to become the national language. But you had other models. For example, in 1911 onwards, there was an Andhra movement here, which said India is not one nation; it's a federation of national states. And if you create not one nation like the Congress and the Rising and many others imagine how India to be, but if you create a federation of nationalities, and each nationality is based on the majority of its language, based on its identity, is built based on that. And it's not just a fictional identity. Now, you had a hundred years of print culture in India by then. So, you have already consolidation of linguistic identities and linguistic communities in India. And all these were stunted. Their growth was stunted once you have a pan-Indian kind of a nationalism that uh, comes into being. And see, uh, which saw these linguistic nationalities as a threat to its own survival. So therefore, the Congress and the uh, capitalist groups who also had their own, especially the Gujarati Marwadis who were uh, interested in having a all India capitalist market wanted to promote Hindi and wanted one India. So therefore, they saw the federation model as a threat to one India model. And that is the time for the decline of the languages. Everything was seen as a threat. Growth of these languages was seen as a threat. And uh, so you have no monetary support. You have uh, no human support to these languages. So you see the decline. So that's, uh, as far as I can see, that is the way that one can understand why these languages are in this kind of a situation. Now coming to the Dalit. Uh, journals. Uh, again, when somebody began to speak a few years ago about uh, Dalit journals, so the whole question was, how, to, how can there be Dalit journals? Because Dalits themselves don't have education. They are, most of them are illiterate. So how can there be? So the, it, it's like sounded like a funny question to ask or a kind of uh, 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 not a wise question to ask. So uh, it was assumed that there are no journals anyway in any of the Indian languages. But uh, the conference I referred to before that Shantan and Rafael organized, I was shocked to see that the kind of journals they brought in there and the kind of things they're finding. And uh, also from Tamil Nadu, uh, so many Super Bala Subramanian, right? yes. his name. There was a person called Bala Subramanian who worked. He brought 50 journals. 50. I couldn't believe it. Then looking at uh, Telugu, uh, Professor K. Satyanarayana is here. Kusuma Dharman uh, way back started uh, in Telugu a journal called Jayabir. But unfortunately, we are not able to get a single copy so far. He contacted so many people. I asked around the contacts I had. We are not able to get any of them. Uh, but anyway, from Tamil Nadu, the Telugu story is different because Tamil Nadu, you had a strong anti-Brahmin movement. So probably one could think that there was an impetus for uh, starting journals and from the non-Brahmins. The Telugu field, the Telugu literary field was quite different. It was dominated by the Brahmins here. So if there are, there aren't many, uh, I mean, if there were, I'm sure we would have at least figured out some of them, but looks like there aren't many. But uh, Chandrasekhar, who is working on uh, Telugu journals, and he has interest in Dalit journals, now he found an interesting way to uh, source this material. So he looked at some of the Christian organizations and the journals which are run by Christian organizations. And it is a lot of 
Dalits seem to have contributed to those journals, even if they were not started by them or run by them. Discussions on caste, etc., happened uh, in those journals. So he is now pulling out some of that stuff and uh, trying to write something, trying to trace. Uh, he also happened to be uh, Professor Satyanarayana's PhD student. So uh, that's about uh, the Dalit journals part. So they do exist. It's not that they are not there. And uh, when I was looking at some of the material, then I accidentally found an Adivasi journal. Not colonial period, but it was started in 1940s, which was run for 10 years. Which was It, it was a four-page journal. I haven't got all the issues. Some of them are missing. And they started and then they closed it after two years because they did not have the funding or resources. They restarted it after two years. So I have copies, some of the copies from the second life of that journal. Uh, I'm trying to get uh, whatever the issues that are missing. Uh, I have, I thought I was not the right person or a competent person to write about it. So I waited for long. I shared the information with two of the two or three of my friends who have done work on uh, tribal literature or, or tribal communities. But they also, because of their own busy schedule and their own interest, their interests are in history, etc., not so much in journals. So they also haven't been able to uh, get to that journal. But I'm hoping maybe uh, I would do something about that. I promised to do that in the last conference, but I haven't done that. Uh, Partly because I'm also a lazy person. Uh, yeah. So, so there is, I think, a lot more to say, but I will not go on. Probably during the discussion, we could, I could come back and add something when they start speaking. So, uh, I'll just start asking them about their work. Uh, so, maybe we could begin with uh, some um, talk about what exactly is the significance of uh, Dalit periodicals? Uh, because I'm, I, I'm not sure how many of them would know. So it will be interesting to even make some introductory kind of remarks. How do you see that? Let's start. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Manohar. Good morning, all of you. I think I'll begin. Spontin what I mean by spontaneity, I'm also uh, sort of referring to this round trip table conference that we back in our university where we had invited Professor Shikla Mukherjee and she was referring to uh, in uh, Marathi and Bangla and specifically look at the Dalit writings, the li Dalit literature, which was produced in uh, little magazines. Now, when we started, uh, why we started with this project? If you look at the anthologies produced by Dalit writers and authors, there is a continuous reference to the little magazines. And uh, we, we have not seen uh, a proper work on little magazines or periodicals, so to say, um, in, in, in English. Uh, in regional languages, there have been some work, but that work has to be also, you know, um, to be taken to a next level and there has to be some kind of a profound study about these little magazines. So that was the point of break for us to uh, uh, really uh, sort of go into this project. So this was a 12 months project, one year project funded by our own university. And we started uh, thinking about, we started discussing about it and then we started Even locating. Mostly? Yes, yes. So this was a research seed grant, uh, short term kind of a project. And then we started, uh, uh, you know, contacting people, tracing, uh, lo uh, locating all these uh, magazines. And then we found some interesting uh, sort of uh, references, contacts. Uh, Maya Pandit also gave us very important uh, contacts to begin with. And then uh, when we actually started working with this, uh, we also sort of wanted to see the interaction between the little magazines and the Dalit periodicals, uh, <clears throat> especially uh, in the post 1950s. Uh, little magazines are usually considered to be anti-establishment. This is one of the defining features of the little <coughs> magazines. Uh, but but uh, when we started uh, reading and thinking about the contribution of the Dalit writings and then coming up of the 
Dalit periodicals more specifically. Um, Dalit periodicals went beyond this idea of challenging the literary traditions. Uh, it was the, the idea of the little magazines was uh, basically to challenge the literary foundation. Uh, but Dalit periodicals went beyond it. They added an element of socio-cultural justice, uh, you know, uh, in the in the making of the periodicals, the editors and all of that. Um, so that is the that was the uh, beginning point for us to also get into the lit periodicals, not just limited to little magazines, but just to go beyond it and think about then exploring the lit periodicals more specifically. Now, if I talk about the significance of the uh, lit periodicals, I think one of the first things that all of us have to recognize is that the lit periodicals have shaped up the lit literature. Uh, if I talk about uh, Arjun Dangle's uh, anthology, The Poison Bread. Uh, there is a reference to this first Dalit literary conference in the 1950, in 1958, uh, where for the first time Dalit literature term was being coined and used, but it went completely unnoticed because of, uh, because the mainstream media did not want to cover the event and whatever, uh, for many other reasons. Uh, but, uh, uh, this, but when um, you know, lot of it came out because in the sixties you see that there is an overlap between uh, the little magazine movement and then the coming of the periodicals. Uh, if the lit periodicals, uh, so to say, if you look at the history and trajectory of the lit periodicals, you can trace it back even before uh, the independence time because. You have uh, Ambedkar's journals and then even before Ambedkar, there were people like Gopal Baba Valankar. He had this uh, magazine called Vitwa, Vital Vidvansak. And then uh, there were also, there was uh, Sri Ram Janaji Kamble. Uh, there was this periodical called Somvan Shimitra. So there was this trajectory, this, this legacy of the Dalit periodicals even before independence. <laughs> Now, with the coming of the little magazine movement in the 60s, um, the, the little magazine movement itself become a platform for the lit writers, uh, you know, uh, to, to showcase their writings, to, to write about their own experiences and all of that. Uh, so, so this aspect is something very, very interesting to be looked at. Then going ahead, I think uh, I would like to talk about uh, two more important things. Uh, that is the spontaneity of uh, the Dalit periodicals and the activism associated with the Dalit periodicals. Spontaneity, what I mean by spontaneity, I am also uh, sort of referring to this round table conference that we had back in our university where we had invited Professor Shipra Mukherjee and she was referring to uh, uh, this, this aspect where books usually take a longer period of time to be published, produced. And, and periodicals live in the movement, right? Periodicals live in the movement. So there is this, with periodicals, there is liveliness. With periodicals, they, there is like, for example, periodicals also represented a, a kind of a life where you connect with masses easily and quickly. And as far as the activism part of uh, this is concerned, you see the editors of these periodicals, they were all activists. We, we see uh, this also in the lit literature. So it was like, you know, a lot of activism into it, uh, not just limiting it to uh, challenging the literary foundations, the literary traditions, but also going beyond that and, um, you know, bring upon the public discourse on, on caste and untouchability. So that is what I feel that why the lit periodicals are very significant. All right, Shanti. Right. So first of all, uh, thank you, Manohar, for you know opening up the session with the context uh, that you provided, and uh, I will try to make a connection with that also and add to what Rahul said. And um, so to begin with, I think, uh, yeah, I think it was understood uh, very early. Uh, it may vary at which decade of the 19th century in different presidencies of India that 
periodicals are probably one of the best weapons people have in shaping public opinion. So to put you out there in the discourse. Uh, and uh, who became the editor, what language was chosen, what, you know, was there a thematic concern given to it? All of it became part of that politics. It was so in Bengal as well. And I'm sure in uh, Western India, in Maharashtra, in Tamil Nadu, it was so. Uh, there was so much debate, I think, we can go into about the choice of language. In Bengal, uh, two particular uh, instances I'm reminded of is a debate about uh, male language, womanly language should be shunned off. It should, the colloquial, the fast, pacey, you know, the, the language before the standardization and why it should be shunned off the periodicals. And another was uh, Islamic Bangla. So the language which has a lot of loan words from Persu, Persu Arabian origin. So that, why, what should be their status? There was a long uh, court case against James Long uh, who actually earlier prepared the reports, three reports he submitted in the middle of 19th century uh, and created this archival category of Islamic Bangla literature uh, so to begin with. But the point that I think uh, I particularly want to harp on and as a bridge uh, with context you provided and the journals is the idea of standardization also. Uh, when we look into a number of uh, periodicals, uh, we see they are not written always in standard Bangla, so to speak. The periodicals that are coming from, you know, different districts of South 24 Perganas or, uh, you know, the border areas of North 24 Perganas, they are written uh, in the printed in a language that, that we don't see anywhere uh, in, in the standard Bangla, that is not used in movies, or in newspapers anywhere. And uh, this is something very important. And we keep talking about it. And as we are creating a website, which we also named vernacular periodicals, the word vernacular itself uh, became a point of contention. Why should we use vernacular or not? We would look forward to that. Uh, but I think uh, besides etymology, the history of the use of words, long history, should be looked into. Uh, and yeah, we look forward to those uh, discussions. And that uh, talks about the politics of language, not only between two languages, but within the language also, the way it goes into. And uh, let me put it this way, that's one of the significance of these journals, to uh, you know provide a platform where not only the Dalit writers and activists can find a platform to uh, you know, reach out to the public, shape probably give some direction to the public opinion, but also to preserve uh, this the nuances of the you know, language that are lost otherwise. Uh, another very important thing, which I would say most of these uh, periodicals from Bangla that we have looked into, in their inaugural issues where we could uh, get hold of them, most of the editors emphasized on is the shrinking space of contestation and resistance, whether it is literary or political voice. And these journals always claim, it's I think a common thread running through all of them, that they envision this journal as a space where contestations and resistance to the mainstream will be in focus. Uh, Another interesting part I think I should add is uh, the cross-language exchange. Uh, we have put this display over here. So uh, we have uh, a paper on the second, uh, the Bahujan Nayak in Bengali, uh, the second last. And also over here, the smaller ones, the left one is Mul Nivashi Mukti Bharta. Now, both of them, the name of the editor is uh, Vaman Mishra. Now, Vaman Mishra never uh, wrote in Bengali, never looked into this paper. So we are talking about a Bahujan politics uh, and its networks spread across different states and languages of India, where Vaman Mishra is probably the, you know, the title editor, but it is, they also start mentioning the editor who is actually editing and doing the job in Bangla, which is Mohindranath Talukdar. And Pradeep Roy for Bahujan Darpa. Mulni Vashi Mukti Sorry. Uh, so, this 
is another significance if you want to trace uh, particularly Bahujan politics and its spread across different languages, different areas. I think these periodicals are a treasure trove. Uh, another aspect, uh, again, it doesn't need to uh, you know, emphasize on Ambedkar and his expertise on law. So we have, uh, of course, Jogendranath Mandal, who also become, albeit for short period, the law minister right, of Pakistan. So he edited uh, a journal and uh, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar came to Calcutta to inaugurate that journal. Now, if you talk about Jogendra Mandal being one of the leader of the Namashudra community, there are, of course, two other very uh, significant and uh, communities among many other scheduled caste communities. One another is Pondu Kshatriya, another is Rajbangshi. Now, Pondu Kshatriya is one, one of the early leaders, uh, Rai Charan Shraddha, and uh, the Rajbongshi community's leader, Ponchanan Rai Burman. So all three of these leaders, interestingly, all of them were involved with legal profession in one way or the other. Uh, whether it's a legacy or their impact, most of these journals, I won't say all of them, but most of them had a dedicated section to talk about the law involving rights. Uh, and, and that's an in very interesting uh, piece that is there in, in the contents, if you just go through it, you see a discussion on the new bill that is coming up or an important court case that is being talked about. Uh, so that that is very interesting. Beside, I think, a number of fact-finding reports. Uh, so we have with us here uh, a copy of Adul Badal. So this was one of the very significant Bangla journals. Uh, and uh, this was uh, edited by Bimal Vishrash and Mala Mitra. So Adul Badul, at least for first five years from 86 to 91, the first section was essays. And the first essay was always by Maheshwita Devi, where she wrote uh, a number of fact-finding reports from her travel in the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe areas. Uh, even in this issue we have, uh, which starts with uh, the plight of the scheduled caste and scheduled caste tribes and the employment exchange. Um, so yeah. Plenty of studies, I think, from multiple disciplinary perspective. If we're talking about research, uh, we can go on probably, and we will come back to some of them when, during the sessions. If I may so, add yeah. one more point, yeah. in addition to what Shantan has already talked about, uh, the significant element in these Dalit periodicals is also the experimentation and the innovation that they have with the content, the shape and size uh, of these magazines or periodicals. I have this uh, pocket size magazine. It's maybe all of you can take a look at it. Pocket size magazine. Yeah, pocket size the magazine. The printout is not like, exactly pocket size. Yeah. yeah. So, expand it. <laughs> the, you can carry it in your pocket. That's, oh, maybe, that's, the, maybe the mobile size. I think yes. uh, I mean, even smaller than that. Even smaller than that. Comrade and Octopus. Comrade and Octopus. Comrade and Octopus. So uh, the, the dimensions the, will be, I think, four the, inches by four inches. Four inches by four inches. Four by three, maybe. No, it's a square so shape. Square shape. Yeah. Square yeah. shape. Yeah. So, and the, the image also is pretty interesting because you can see uh, the title itself is very interesting. Mm -hmm. The image itself is also very interesting because there is this uh, hand you, you can see and that hand is actually the octopus okay. and the fingers are actually the tentacles and the comrade is being grabbed. <laughs> so, <laughs> that is kind of also some kind of a political commentary yeah. on the movement itself, the communist it's movement. In like. Yes, and this is published by one of the um, Dalit Panther poet, Uma Kant Ranveer. And very, uh, you know, I mean, it has, uh, this magazine has uh, certain poems which specifically talk about the communist uh, ideas movement and then also critique. So, that's, I mean, so those kinds of experimentation and innovation are quite interesting so that's what we also found quite interesting when we were locating these magazines right. so in, in telugu for example there is i mean when i was looking for uh, any material on this journal so i found only one book by Potur venkateshwar rao 
uh, which gives you like one paragraph information about every journal that existed, but uh, no mention of Jai Bairi, which is supposed to be, I mean, he was a tall leader and a scholar, Kusumu Dharman in his own time. And his journal that he started doesn't find any reference in this book. So anyway, so I'll not go into that more. But one thing that I wanted to add to what you said about language, there was a lot of discussion in Telugu also, when Telugu had to be standardized, whose language should be used for the standard form, whether it is in the journals or newspapers or books, etc. So while, as I said, the Telugu print media was dominated by the upper caste and mainly the Brahmins, they wrote in highly Sanskritized Telugu, which even today I can't understand if I read them. I need assistance from a pundit, Sanskrit pundit. And they clearly in the debates mentioned that the language of uh, uh, Malas and Madigas, who are Dalit castes, do, does not qualify to be the standard. And they have given them a name to this language used by the Dalits, which is called Gramyam. So there are and articles and articles were written to argue that the language of the Dalits will not qualify to be the standard Telugu. Anyway, that's just a small addition. So we'll just move on to the maybe the next round of conversation. So could you also please, since Rahul just started with the small uh, sure. pocket journal, anyways, I, we, it would be more interesting to know about uh, how did the production process happen or uh, who were the writers and what were they actually writing about, maybe more focus on some of the issues that they dealt with in these journals, etc. if you could start with. Yeah, sure. Um, as far as the production process, uh, the major um, writers and the material, the kind of material and that have been produced, uh, one of the major problem was uh, the lack of monetary resources. Uh, you know, while these uh, magazines were published and produced. Um, so you have um, in the little magazine movement, it began in the 60s. You have people like Ashok Shahani uh, and then uh, Raja Dhale was also someone who was very closely associated with the little magazine movement. Um, all these people used to gather and then generate some kind of money. Um, I mean, though in a very small uh, sort of uh, quantity, but uh, that is what I mean. There was no organizational kind of a setup to this. Um, uh, so, so they had their own challenges of how these materials can be produced and circulated across. So that was uh, one of the challenges. And then uh, you, you also had this idea of small press, small printing press. So Raja Dhale, uh, when he associated, he associated himself with the little magazine movement, there were particular localities in Mumbai like Dadar and all these places where he would go on his own, try to find all these printing presses because there were various kinds of issues, be it the issue, political uh, kind of a framework where you cannot actually reach out to these uh, publishers and all. So he would involve himself in finding such places in and around Mumbai and then get in touch with them. He will work with them. He will also uh, sort of uh, look at the paper. He himself was a calligrapher. Uh, and and uh, there's this interesting uh, um, idea called the cyclo style journals. You may have probably heard about it. Yes, I, um, I, I don't know whether you have heard about it, but uh, the cyclo style uh, magazines uh, were, were uh, quite popularly used uh, when the little magazine movement was uh, sort of on the rise uh, in the 1960 to 1970 within that, uh, that period. Uh, so this, uh, this this idea of small printing press really helped the little magazine movement and it also sort of continued helping the, the periodicals. Um, there are, uh, apart from that, uh, I would also like to show you this magazine called Chakravarti, which was um, edited by Raja Dhali and uh, Satish Karsekar. It's very interesting. So, there is this chakra, and this chakra is a modernist chakra that you get to see. 
and uh, chakravarti yeah the different meaning in chakravarti what means follower so you can see this chakra and uh, there are certain names there all these names are actually the editors of little magazine magazines mm -hmm. these are the writers editors of little magazines can you just read out the names yeah yeah sure sure, sure. sure. so you uh, had around 24 maybe some such yeah. people so there is raja dali there is vasant gurjer there is vasant abaji tahake there is satish kalsekar ashok shahani anil vandekar eknath patil chandrakant patil chandrakant patil was there with us uh, in the round table that we had with us and we had in geetam uh, and there are few more so this is like also i mean the the imagery itself is quite interesting you know and and raja dali himself was very influenced with buddhist ideology and uh, so one of the reasons why he brought in this kind of image is also you know to to stamp that this is exclusively going to be uh, you know uh, dalit sort of uh, in nature and form and it is going to be uh, also talking about certain public discourses on untouchability and caste so uh, uh, this was one of the things then also i think uh, there are certain references uh, made to the buddhist kind of poet you can just look at it it's in english only something in english so what so what dhale would do is that he will bring people from uh, the buddhist scholars and people from uh, japan germany and all these places and he will have his own points of view to make so that kind of an impact i mean since he was influenced with the buddhist ideology a lot and then he, he also had certain columns uh, very interesting columns and in these columns he would uh, make a critique of the ongoing situation he will make a socio political critique of certain situations uh, very interestingly uh, there is this uh, thing that he says uh, the column the title of the column is ethe thobad rang mul milel meaning you get three slaps here and he would simply you know um, in order to critique certain people uh, he he will have that column so such things were quite interesting that we found um, yeah i think yeah, so it was the bangla situation similar or different or how it was if you could and also i just wanted to just keep time and we could come back uh, you could maybe make your response slightly shorter so that we'll have time for discussion yeah. sure, sure. because i think i have quite a number of things to ask <laughs> so yeah so yeah i think uh, rahul has already spoken about uh, the struggles of little magazine enterprises which was all the same uh, the one uh, fine uh, difference so to speak i would say you see when we talk about resources we talk about uh, financial resources but there is also uh, social capital right when we uh, do not have the financial uh, you know finance to support the publication and all you may have uh, you may be part of a larger network who would do the illustrations for you or who would uh, so support and chip in in many ways Uh, i think one difference with the little magazine movement and the dalit periodicals and its publication is the lack of that social capital as well uh, when i look into bangla periodicals as i have spoken to some of the printers also so uh, initially there were four centers uh, spread all over uh, west bengal uh, where it, from whichever district it is coming up they used to go to those those printers because they could not afford others Uh, so that that's the uh, you know truth of it uh, around 15 20 years back uh, all of them came together and got a printer of their own near this place called shialda in um, kolkata so most of this uh, you know periodicals that are on the table they get published from the same printer it may be like you know two editors are engaged in a heated discussions in their issues but they get printed their discussions also from the same printer so they try to get into that circuit 
it takes uh, a genius person like uh, probably Raja Dhale who would go into the other printers and see the scrap paper left out and think about how can I you know recycle these scrap papers and come up with an issue. Uh, the impact of this production process uh, is also related to the crisis that we see in preservation. Uh, the paper quality, the ink, the gum, and the whole making of it has made it, uh, I think, uh, prone to all sorts of dangers. Uh, aging, um, insects. Uh, I was told by the printer that you know, the gum is like the poison. Uh, and then there are certain uh, gums that draw more insects. And they keep eating not only the gum, they adapt to the paper also. They li start liking the papers. Uh, so uh, again, um, change in the number of pages. Uh, eventually, if you want to carry on. Uh, difference in sizes. If you see over here also, we have uh, what we call the tabloid size. These are mostly published uh, in the 60s and 70s. But as we are moving towards 80s, we see this format emerging. Uh, even in 2000, we have uh, nowadays one of the popular formats is this, which is a folded A4 size, so this format. Uh, number of pages are changing, formats are changing, uh, frequency is changing, which is starting as bi-weekly, uh, eventually becoming quarterly enterprises. Uh, so these are all, uh, you know, due to the pressure on the productions. Uh, another interesting part is circulation. Yeah, I think I we can about to ask, like, how did they really circulate these? Okay. Yeah. Should I carry on? Yeah, please. I yeah. think then we will move on to it. Yeah. So uh, circulation is, there, there is, again, uh, of course, a uh, lot of fight to get a you know, place in, let's say, the famous Calcutta Book Fair. Uh, there have been tables given. There have been tables withdrawn. Uh, not only Calcutta, the, that international book fair, but uh, other uh, district book fairs, there had been a lot of struggle. Uh, even recently, uh, one of the editors shared uh, the story from Bogula. Uh, the location is near near uh, the border. In the Bogula Book Fair, there was uh, a lot of struggle to get a place to you know showcase not only uh, Neer, which she edits, but also other uh, periodicals and books. After a lot of struggle, there has been one uh, shop that has been uh, purchased and being used in the famous College Street region in Kolkata. So that's probably the only shop which has uh, a uh, you know, enviable collection of books coming from all over West Bengal. Uh, there had, the, the struggle is not only because of you know, uh, the lack of space where you can showcase the books and sell, but also because of advertisement. Uh, carrying out advertisement for you know, when you're struggling to publish is uh, unthinkable. So I think what they have uh, tried to uh, uh, you know, come up with is a kind of advertisement, mutual advertisement within these periodicals. So we have with us uh, this eight page uh, issues of Dalit Kant. So the last page, if you can see, uh, always carried uh, you know, the advertisements from all other publications, uh, the Namashudra, the Poundra community publications that are happening around the time, where to obtain them and prices. So it was there in all of its issues. And uh, not only uh, the Litkan, but a number of them started doing that. So uh, advertising their own publications without cost and dedicating a space in their publications always. Uh, how is the number, like is the volume, how many, any idea of? Yeah, so for example, Adul Badul, uh, uh, which I said was one of the it, like, very famous Mahesh Pita Devi wrote in it, uh, publications in the 86. So they used to publish around uh, 1,200 copies initially. 1200, okay. But when we talk about like the pub publications that are happening now, for example, we have Akhon Tokhon. So one of the uh, Bangla journals edited by a woman. Uh, besides Kollani Thakur, I think this is the second journal, which the only two journals in Bangla, uh, talking about you know Dalit feminism and writing edited being edited by women. Uh, so they approximately publish 800 copies uh, okay. in an issue. 
So yeah, that's. So you want to add something about circulation? I think I will uh, make two, to. two quick points. Initially, when the little magazine movement began, little lo can you speak? Little louder. Initially, when the little magazine movement began, uh, the circulation of these magazines was for private circulation. What is private circulation? Private circulation in the sense that they used to be circulated within family and friends <coughs> and also that is also for obvious reasons why it was uh, you know, being circulated privately. The other important aspect is also the non-commercial nature of these little magazines. These magazines were non-commercial again for obvious reasons because you know they, they highlighted this uh, you know the most difficult part of it like the public discourse on uh, social issues be it caste or untouchability or whatever so all those uh, things were uh, very important for the as far as the circulation strategies uh, is concerned um, and then as shantan has already pointed out um, these the circulations used to mostly happen in during the book fairs public meetings uh, and all of that and then then uh, there was also a struggle for space as he was also mentioning and that is how they had to do it during the public meetings and then book fairs and all of that yeah that's all so maybe you could uh, continue with maybe if you could talk about how these journals were also received and uh, also the relationship between those journals which you actually began when you began you said uh, these journals actually shaped the dalit movement so what I mean, if you could add a little more about in what ways that process happened. Yeah. So, initially, uh, there was a limited readership. I mean, who would want to uh, read the lit periodicals? So, there was a real challenge there uh, since uh, the, I mean, it was difficult. See, I also said that there was private circulation. And, uh, and this this idea also shapes into something called as limited readership. So there was a real struggle at that level. And then, uh, if you see, uh, especially uh, after 1965, uh, when we speak about some of these uh, Dalit periodicals like Babura Bagul's Ami, I have. Uh, so we have collected this magazine called Ami. This was by Babura Bagul. And this is in uh, 1971. And the first essay uh, that you have here is uh, Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar's speech, Mukti Kon Pathe, What Way Emancipation. Um, so some such things were brought into limelight uh, with the emergence of these periodicals. And, and uh, that is how they were also able to uh, sort of, um, you know, put up a discourse on caste and untouchability. There are lot many referenced, uh, references to the movement itself, um, uh, be it the movement at the ground or be it the movement at the larger scenario. Uh, so so that's, that was like, I mean, that is how these, uh, though the reception was not on a higher note, this could create some kind of a consciousness in the lower classes middle uh, class kind of masses and people who also believed in the idea of uh, communism and all all those things yeah i think i'll so yeah about uh, reception uh, or impact uh, i think uh, from uh, 1907 uh, we have the first uh, namashudra community uh, Periodical called Namushudra Hitoishi, Potaka, Namushudra Bundhu. And uh, it, it um, so, so the point that I'm trying to, uh, you know, uh, say this, whether it was shaping up the public opinion to begin with, uh, putting your thoughts out there in, in uh, you know, among all other periodicals that are there, uh, writing uh, as an activism. I think uh, one of the legacies of this periodical culture is, uh, you know, sh looking at writing as part of your activism. Um, we we start seeing not only uh, you know organizations, societies coming up 
in the name of you know namashudra society namashudra organization but namashudra writers associations namashudra you know thinkers associations and this is a phenomenon that we keep seeing from as at least as documented uh, keep seeing from 60s onwards at least uh, another aspect of uh, this uh, thing is and i think this will take us back to uh, the nomenclature dalit periodicals and all so i'm not sure that the early 20th century when they are uh, you know 1907 1911 when we this periodicals because we have not able, have not been able to trace them uh, but their title suggests a very strong connection with the community namashudra hitoishi so are we to think uh, every community have their periodicals was it uh, in the title was it the editor was it the writer so what what was exactly the connection how do we say this is a namashudra periodical this is a mala periodical or this is a madhika periodical did we uh, say that the editor stopped others from publishing in it uh, as we can see with the you know periodicals in bangla uh, not exactly uh, but still th there is a coexistence that there, though there are people from other communities writing in it uh, this periodicals are also maintaining an identity as namasudra or a pondra a periodical now i think it is because uh, also uh, the community is finding a lot of pride in it and uh, as i said writing as activism they try to vie for a space to be published also uh, a lot of people like today we see translations of manoranjan bapari uh, a lot in english so he also started publishing in the little magazines edited by Maheshwata Devi Bortika. So yes, I think uh, this this is, uh, is is one aspect. Another, I think, uh, is reflected in uh, the kind of projects we have conceptualized and others uh, we are hoping will be conceptualizing is the need to you know preserve them and uh, also go into the idea of you know what sort of uh, research is that can be done in it i think that uh, is something that we should hope that that will emerge and soon right. uh, no, preservation is an interesting thing see here uh, we have uh, archives in hyderabad and also telugu university library when for my own work when i visited i was like scared to touch any book it's almost like becoming powder you, you no. can't and then i went to the british library in london when I visited NTU and I spent some three weeks there and I found uh, the first Telugu Bible which was published in 1812 in perfect condition. So there is also something about preservation technology etc required and which I think the main language, I mean the mainstream journals books themselves are fading away and uh, they are becoming powder. So therefore, it will be very interesting to hear, I mean, if you have found mm. that how, who is preserving this with no resources, no technological support, <laughs> no social support, who is preserving them and how are they preserving? I mean, if you could just tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, it, it's also at times mostly individuals. And uh, on that note, let me circulate this uh, three sets of uh, photocopies that I have. These are mostly. Uh, illustrations of the cover pages is the same set uh, and uh, so a very famous poet Poonendu Potri uh, designed these uh, cover pages for Adul Badal. Now yeah the scene is bleak and we can't emphasize more on this. I think uh, the lack of institutional support uh, makes uh, to this but we should also understand see when we talk about North Bengal and now I think after the flood in Sikkim, we are also talking about Tista, Tista barrage, 80s, uh, the whole uh, you know, place changed. And 60s floods every year uh, to talk about Maharashtra, different places, uh, though there is arid regions, but there is also huge amount of water logging in, in Mumbai. There is uh, moist weather, humidity to talk about other parts of Bengal, South 24 Perganas, North 24 Perganas, full of rivers. So it, it puts another additional layer uh, of you know challenges 
how do you keep this very fragile to begin with you know made of uh, low cost paper and you know you look at uh, this copy this is uh, they used uh, staplers right so you can understand like how difficult it will be to maintain a copy like this for a longer period of time um, so these these are certain problems and that's why uh, we we struggled we could not find and we were told uh, most of the journals uh, from the northern part of bengal jalpaiguri koch bihar uh, uh, 60s are gone so yeah it is a big silence on that so sir rahul can you tell how you sourced the material and where did you source them from whatever you planned? yeah yeah sure Uh, so as shantan has already pointed out uh, the personal sort of self manage preservation uh, during our field trips uh, when we had established certain contacts uh, jv power was also there for our conference we had invited him so he was one of those sources where we could uh, trace the dalit periodicals from he has a huge collection but getting that collection was also very difficult because there was we had to really uh, sort of convince him and perceive him that we are doing something like this and if we don't do this this will be lost uh, because of various reasons as he has already said like 40 50 years uh, of time has already gone by uh, and then you know there are certain uh, material conditions because of which uh, these magazines would not survive uh, longer so that was uh, uh, our point of source then we also uh, went to shivaji university uh, with the help of maya pandit ma'am we met uh, the head of the department from the marathi department randir shinde and then we could sort of uh, you know look at their library so there is there is some certain collection there but again there are uh, practical problems uh, because you may not be able to access the periodicals uh, and and uh, you may not be able to also tell them that you are uh, probably doing something like this uh, they would allow you to maybe take the pictures some pictures and then you know all of that take some xerox and all but they would not really um, give you this for digitization so that was another uh, challenge that we faced uh, as far as uh, uh, you know thinking about location and then also trying to uh, fetch them or access them um there there are f- few more things like uh, uh, since he was also mentioning the flood situation and all of that we met uh, ramesh shinde uh, who, who lives in mumbai and he has collected huge amount of ambedkar's literature Uh, when we visited him we could see the material that he has and in fact this octo uh, comrade and octopus was actually uh, fished from there so there there was this flood and all and he lost so many magazines because of that uh, but we could you know sort of request him uh, if he if he had some of such uh, magazines so these are some of the challenges these are some of the sources from where we could uh, you know we also met arjun dangle uh, and and he uh, there, there is this uh, mumbai granth sangrahalay which has the collection of uh, some of these periodicals but again there is a uh, problem there because the the moment you contact they would say that it is it is under renovation and the access is sort of limited and i am not saying this uh, just like that because we have heard the same thing from many other people so that access is it's really really difficult it's been under extension for <laughs> yeah <two>. see <laughs> that's what Forever. so we have been told the same that you know renovation and probably you will not be able to access it so yeah thank you okay i think uh, we should i have one more thing to ask but i think it can come little later uh, so now I think it's uh, open for uh, some questions from all of you. Yes, sir. First of all, I should uh, congratulate all uh, three of you, and because um, I am educated, so a lot of uh, interesting information. Congratulations! 
uh, I have two queries. That is, uh, my objection regarding the word vernacular. Uh, because when the colonial officer looked down at uh, Indian languages, they coined this term vernacular. That is not at all acceptable. And we can use that word. Uh, of course, we can refer that as the, the colonial officers used uh, looking at the Indian language like that. But when we are writing uh, our own writings, then uh, that is not acceptable. And uh, the words Indian languages or regional languages are quite uh, um, honorific. Or, and that is one uh, observation. And uh, one thing is, when you mentioned about the language caste wise, but when uh, the discussions uh, for uh, decades together, when the discussions uh, went on regarding the what is the Grammy Basha, what is the Vyavaharika Basha, what is the Sesta Vyavaharika, and uh, what is the Grandika Basha, and which kind of language should be used in magazines, and uh, which, which is standardization, then the language was not mentioned in the name of, but in the category of Mala language, Madiga language, or Shudra language, or Brahman language. Of course, Brahman kind of uh, uh, dialect is there. That is, uh, that is mentioned by the, in the linguistics also. But when they talked about the standardization language, whose language should be standardized, then this kind of discussion was not there on Mala language or Madiga language or Shudra language. It is not uh, categorized in the name of castes. But only exception is Brahmin kind of, uh, uh, that is also uh, Vaidika Brahmin language. That, that is also particularly mentioned. But this is my observation that uh, when the Grandika Vyavaharika Bhasha dialogue was going on for four to five decades, right from the Gurjadapara and uh, Gidugu Ram Murthy, I, as my memory goes, this kind of categorization was not there. I, I really enjoyed uh, your presentations. Thank you. And I like how you contextualized everything, Prof. Reddy. But really, very f uh, fascinating. I just wanted to know perhaps a little more between the relationship of publishers and writers for the little magazines and for uh, and between the Dalit, Dalit periodicals. Because some of the names you said, you know, Pabon Mishro, uh, Brahmin, right? So also, so what is going on between them? Are they in conversation? Are they completely ignorant of the other? Um, you know, so this, this was my question. Rahul. Uh, I think you might make it a little more clearer about the, you know, comrade and uh, that octopus, uh, because you need to take into account the background of this when the Sayukta Maharashtra movement was going on. The communists had taken lead over it, and they were very popular. But not only in the establishment, they are also very anti-establishment, and a lot of those people, like Satish Kalasekar, for instance were helpful to the periodicals. Now, Raja Dhale was an anti-communist. And, you know, all these um, inner contradictions amongst uh, people who in, you brought out the ma Dalit uh, periodicals also reflect this kind of a tension between two political ideologies. And, um, you know, there, there were lots of uh, um, operation um, incidents happening against Dalits during the same time. So, how, I mean, what kind of a tension do you see behind that? Because, you know, uh, that has been, because that is where the Dalit Panthers came into, uh, you know, it was divided. Um, Arjun Dangle and Namdev Dasal versus Raja Dhalle and the others. So, the seeds were sown right from this uh, moment. So, I think if you might make it a little clearer about the t social and political tensions between, literary political tensions between these two groups that might be a little more useful to understand the predicaments before uh, you know the periodicals uh, run out run by uh, Dalit intellectuals. Yeah, so we will respond and then we'll open up again next round. Uh, so vernacular, yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, I didn't get your name, Professor. Subhachar. Subhachar, yeah. Thank you for questions and uh, 